Hello and welcome everyone um, tuning in to the Hubscale podcast. This week we have Patrick Smith, Head of Data and AI at Google. Um, I'm super excited to delve into some of the topics that we have in store, um, everything AI, everything Patrick. Um, thanks for joining me, Patrick. It's uh, it's great to have you. Yeah, uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so just to kick us, kick us off, um, tell us a little about a little bit about yourself, a bit about your journey and, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit unconventional. So I uh, lead our data and AI team for uh, one of our industries at Google Cloud. Uh, specifically, we focus in on telecom, media, entertainment, and gaming companies. Uh, my team uh, works with those companies to customize and build out our Google Cloud products, more or less. So we work directly with their engineering teams, directors of engineering, energy leadership, and try to figure out how we can improve their business, help them along, really make Google Cloud the, the best platform that we can for them. Um, but yeah, my journey is a little bit uh, unconventional. I've been doing machine learning and AI for essentially my entire career. I uh, actually studied economics in college and graduated and went into quantitative finance. Uh, so my first job was analyzing mortgage-backed securities <laughs> and then decided, I was fortunate enough where I had a really good mentor who really, um, who was taking a look at my work and I had always been interested in computers. I've always been around computers since I was a kid and I was, I knew programming. And so I came into this job, the finance job with uh, some programming experience. And so I was like, Hey, I can automate this. I can build a program here. And he kind of looked at my work and said, you might be interested in this kind of emerging field that everybody's talking about really data science and machine learning. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take a look. Yeah. And so the journey kind of started there. And I went through a variety of jobs, engineering jobs, mostly for consulting companies. I ended up building a engineering, uh, a machine learning engineering uh, side of a business for a mid-sized consulting company and did a lot of things along the way, taught, wrote a book about it, um, really just been involved since and ended up at Google and uh, the rest is history, I suppose. Yeah, nice. And and what other than you know Google because obviously you've gone from a, a great career like what attracted you to Google? <laughs> well, it was a really 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 oh. great place to do AI. Yeah, it's uh honestly one of the best things is I have always enjoyed being a little bit of a self starter and kind of creating things, and I've mostly done that within larger companies. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that Google is really, really good at is allowing people to kind of have a little bit of free reign in what they're doing. And so when I came in, it's a little bit intimidating. You know, you get thrown in and anybody who's worked for one of the big tech companies probably has a similar experience of, you know, they don't really tell you what to do. It's more just good luck. Here's a general description of your job. Figure it out. Um, that worked really well for me. And at the, and at the same time, you know, I was... You know, everything I've ever done is, is kind of consultative and, and customer facing. And so being in that ambiguous environment while at the same time having to more or less answer a real business value uh, helped me grow tremendously. And that was extremely, extremely appealing. So, I mean, you essentially get to work with the best AI, you get to work with the best researchers, you get to work with the best of everything. And then, um, you know, at the same time, hone your skills across a little bit of everything, which has been exciting. Yeah. How how's your role evolved over there? Because I know you've grown and, and gone through different stages within that space as well. But yeah, how's it evolved to where it is now? Yeah, it's uh, super interesting, actually. So I think I mentioned before, I uh, was essentially an engineering manager prior to coming to Google. And when I came in, I came in as a, <laughs> again, other, uh, other big tech people will laugh at this, as a mid-level, a down-leveled individual contributor, which was different. I was like, hey, you know what? It's Google. I'm going to take the chance. I'm just going to do it. And so I was working on, you know, machine learning and data science for cloud for a variety of New York-based media and entertainment companies. Uh, mainly, we did a huge project with Major League Baseball when Google Cloud um, had a big contract there. Uh, so that was super exciting. And then I just started kind of growing in the role, I guess. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, be the first person on the ground for this new group. And mm -hmm. that was within our gaming team. And I grew that. And then that was successful enough where I had the opportunity to then lead this larger scope team for across the entire industry vertical. So um, just super fortunate that 
you know, people like my work, people like what I was doing and was able to grow. It also did, it also helped that I was an engineering manager beforehand, but it's definitely been interesting. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds amazing. And, and like you said, you've, you've obviously grown and developed teams, small, large. Um, and I, I think, you know, that, that leads me to my, probably, yeah, one of the, one of the major sort of questions that I've got is like, what, what have been the biggest challenges for you? And that might be, you know, professionally, technically, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that you've, you've seen and faced in, in not just Google, but prior to that as well. But yeah, what, what's been the biggest challenges for you really? What have you seen? Yeah, it's a bit of a wide question. So I'll try to break that down. Mm -hmm. um, technically, I think one of the biggest challenges is, especially now out in the market, being somebody in the machine learning field writ large without a formal background or degree in machine learning is extremely difficult. I was very fortunate that I got in on the ground level of a lot of these things. And I, I consider myself a pr pretty good self learner. Um, and so it worked out for me, but I think folks coming in the market today, I mean, for God's sakes, if you want to be um, just as standard, I shouldn't say standard, but if you just want to be a software engineer and machine learning in a lot of places, they're asking for PhDs or multiple yeah. master's degrees, which is yeah. a huge barrier. As you probably know, there's a massive shortage of talent now. And so that's extremely intimidating, right? And I have had points over my professional career where people have doubted me. Mm -hmm. I've had points where, especially, you know, one that comes to mind is when everybody started pivoting towards deep neural networks as the way to go. I was very much a proponent of utilizing deep neural networks were applicable. And I was, you know, faced with people who were still very much in the paradigm of statistical learning, which is wonderful. We're always going to have statistical learning. We don't need to get into that debate, but, you know, just thinking about how we can push the boundary a little bit in terms of what we're doing, in terms of research, in terms of implementation, um, you know, people, people doubt you because you don't have the formal educational background. And even, yeah. you know, it turned out to be right. Just because, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, personally, look, as part of that, I would say there's, there's a lot of doubt the entire way. I think going, you know, progressing in your career, and um, people, I think people look at progressing in your career as some type of linear thing. And there's an amazing amount, I think for any technical person, of doubt of, I hate to use the term, but of imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. of doubt about your abilities. And especially, you know, at a place like Google or, or really any large company, right? People become hyper competitive about these type of things. And so um, that measure of self-doubt has been interesting to overcome, but ultimately, you know, it's a, it's a challenge you, you have to overcome. So a uh, long-winded answer, but yeah, look, there's been ups and downs, um, you know, doubt in terms of what I can do and what I can't do. Um, you know, just having to really reinvent and improve yourself over and over and over again. It's sometimes exhausting, but it's what one has to do, I suppose. How, how have you, it's probably a very tough question uh, to answer, but how have you sort of overcome that, and, and sort of made sure you keep bouncing back, you know, with, with, you know, having maybe the doubters or, you know, when something hasn't gone quite your way and, and yeah, how have you sort of overcome that? I'd say the best thing is to just show people, right. Um, is to prove you can do something is to just do it. If somebody t is doubting you and your ability to do a project or a task or research for God's sakes, yeah, do it. It might take you a longer time, self-study, do it, buckle down, just prove that you can do it. Um, you know, there are plenty of good resources that I recommend to folks on my team and other folks who come to ask books, um, don't quote me all of them off the top of my head, but, you know, resources that you can learn this, right. Just enable to, to plug into the ML field. You don't have to be, uh, a research scientist, right. Yeah. You need to be a good engineer who understands machine learning and who can understand their way about it, around a problem and has the innate ability, I think, to creatively problem solve. So, um, you know, a little bit of self-learning. And then I'd say just, you know, doing it, right? <laughs> just just proving, proving it to both yourself and proving it to other people. Do you, th do you think um, the self-learning as well, like, because like you said earlier as well, so with everybody's looking for PhDs and, and yeah. you know, for the, for engineers and individual contributors and, and whatnot do you think that self-learning is is something that people need to be doing 
from the early days and from the start to really help with their their career and their growth and and getting into those positions that they want to get into to, to differentiate themselves from from others as well i mean i think uh having a self-culture of self-learning is always important right i would say because there are so many barriers because it's so difficult nowadays find if people are looking to get into machine learning or AI, I would say find something in the realm that does not involve that core credential and then prove yourself in it and move closer to whatever it is you want to do. So for instance, if you're coming and you're coming from a consulting company, right? And maybe you've worked on data science and machine learning projects, but you've done, you've done clustering, you've done regressions, you've done kind of standard analysis type stuff. You want to move more towards that, you know, core ML and AI, in your role or in the role that you're looking at, find something adjacent and be really good at it and prove that you are more technically savvy than the other people in that role. And you will get noticed for that, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, frankly, the only way to, it's, it's you know, I would say it's you're, you either take the front door or you smash through the wall. You got to smash through the wall a little bit. You have to prove that you are technically savvy and you while you have a voice. The difficult thing I think is when you know, folks are sitting in a situation and they say, I want to get into something and they really want to become a, an ML engineer, a property, yeah. you know, and I'm working on core ML code, but they don't have a voice to show people. They're sending in resumes. They might've done some self-study. They might've done GitHub projects, whatever it is. They don't have that voice to show somebody. So doing something adjacent that gives you that opportunity that, that could be a consultative role. That could be, heck, if you are really good at talking to people, maybe you do AI sales, even if you are technical, and then show that you're technical, right? Doing something adjacent, and when you have that platform to show the leaders of company, the leaders of a startup, or whoever it is, that you can do it, I think is the most powerful thing. Just get your foot in the door somewhere. Yeah, that's great. That's really good advice. I think, and that was, if I'm honest, it was one of the, one of the points that I was going to ask you as well, you know, about advice to somebody looking to start their career and um yeah is there anything more that you would you know if, if you could go back and, and sort of give advice to yourself or give you advice to other people trying to get into this industry is there anything that else i know you've really touched on it there to be fair but is sure. there anything else um that you could think of don't be discouraged number one right um i think it's really unfortunate nowadays i I realize we have to have standardized ways of testing people for jobs, but I think it's really unfortunate that we disqualify a lot of very good people in a lot of the interview processes we use in tech writ large, right? Um, you know, I, I will go out of limb here. I think a lot of interview processes nowadays test for the interview rather than testing for your ability to do a job. I applaud people who do things like take home tests and things like that. Um, look, anyways, this stuff is hard. It's difficult. Yeah. It's a barrier, right? Don't be discouraged, number one, in addition to all the other things I just said. Mm -hmm. If you can't get exactly what you want, try to find that adjacent role. Try to find something that is one step closer with the ultimate goal. And then also consider really what do you want to do at the end of the day, right? Um, do, you, do you really want to do research? Do you really want to build systems? Do you really want to talk about those systems, right? Figure out where your differentiator is and lean into it. I think... Far too often, I see folks who are like, tell me what to do, right? Tell me what to do. That's great, but like, what is the motivation? Because if the motivation is there, it's going to carry you so much further than me just telling you what to do, right? Anyways, long rambling thing. But yeah, in addition to what we were talking about before with just trying to find those adjacent roles, don't be discouraged. It's hard. Try to find companies that are amenable to the way that you think you work, you know, uh, that you are, it's going to work better for you long-term anyways. And then figure out what that differentiator is and really lean into it. Yeah. So many people are willing to help if you can tell them what you're looking for. People yeah. do not want to tell you what to look for. But if you have a very specific idea of what you want to do, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to help. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think the networking side of things and just leaning into it and speaking to as many people as possible as well. Like you said, having a good a good mentor like you did, you know, initially and, and at the start of your career, I think, I think that's really important. And, and I think obviously if you don't have that mentor reaching out to people across the ecosystem and across that, that space is so important that, 
um, where you can learn and develop and, and home in on everything that you want to home in on. I think that's going to, yeah, really push it. So I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, yep. we, we've sort of, um, you know, fluctuated and deviated. I, I, so I, I wanted to talk about a little bit more around the AI and like the trends and, you know, I suppose what exa- what is it, what's exciting you for, you know, because AI is massive and AI is huge and it's, it's been here for a long time. Um, but we're seeing it more and more and more and, you know, we're seeing a lot of buzz around it and, and obviously good and bad. And um, But what what's exciting you about it, I suppose, and, and what are you sort of seeing potentially coming up in, in this space that, um, yeah, you're excited about? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a little bit of a biased answer because of the area that I work in, but I am most excited about all the emerging uh, video generation, 3D asset generation, we're already at realistic image, but I will say media generation. Um, it's a very sensitive topic area, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, um, a lot of sensitivity around creatives and how this affects their workloads and whatnot. I view a lot of this emerging technology as an additive to what creatives are going to be doing anyways. And one of the wonderful things that you think about is take. I'm going to take a very specific angle here. So I used to work a lot. And still do, um, but I used to work exclusively with gaming companies. Huge thing for gaming companies is 3D asset creation. So think about um, creating in-game items or in-game worlds on the fly, right? Extremely powerful, opens up a whole wealth of experiences for the individual. In terms of if you, you yourself are a small game developer, small game studio, mm-hmm. think about your ability to actually create really 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 good art in the form of a game if you don't have to hire you know 10 developers 50 developers whatever it is to individually create that which is massively intensive in terms of cost time whatever those 3d asset creation models so high fidelity 3d models which google's working on nvidia has some great models out there there's a lot of good open source research and models out there as well um is extremely, extremely exciting because that opens up a whole realm of possibilities. And this also goes into not just entertainment, but you can think of things about like industrial digital twins for warehouses or things like that. It cuts down a certain, you know, uh, time to market and allows for a whole bunch of possibilities that wouldn't be financially feasible otherwise. And then in terms of, you know, realistic video generation, we're seeing great models out from Google, OpenAI, or, you know, a ton of them coming out right now. Same reasons, super exciting. Um, I think we all know it's a lot of projects that would be creatively interesting or creatively profitable just aren't pursued because the financial sink up front, nobody's willing to do that, you know, especially in today's environment. And so handing a little bit of that power back where you know a team of two can come up with a really great marketing creative ad or you you can come up with a really great game or a really great something is extremely extremely powerful and if you look at the research like there's different angles of this um you know the 3d asset creation there's a lot of research that's been putting in that direction you get like uh text to video models that have been a new focus um it's personally extremely exciting for me because it's it's almost like the the apotheosis of, of what we can do with this technology, right? Generating something that's enjoyable by humans. I don't know. Yeah, I can see that um, that passion um, that you've got for it as well. Do do you um do you see any challenges or I don't want a word. I'll I'll use the word negatives really. But yeah, do you see any challenges, any negatives? You know, from your side. You know, you you've been in it for a long time. Um, yep. But do you see any negatives or any challenges? uh about ai writ large um could be within yeah let, let's go a bit larger yeah what what yeah. is there anything that you see that, that you could potentially that you're hearing or thinking and yeah you know the usual suspects maybe but yeah what do you think yeah i'm going to be uh be on one of those usual suspects so uh i think we need to be very very sensitive to job displacement mm. likely, right you think about any any field could be the law could be doctors could be um all the creative things i just mentioned the flip side of enabling individuals is that 
you also can run a law office with less lawyer, less junior lawyers. You can run a bank with less junior bankers, and you can run a medical practice with less junior doctors, nurses, whatever it is, right? Um, this gets into bigger societal issues, which you know I don't think is the topic of this podcast, but mm-hmm. uh, it is something I think we need to be very sensitive about. Um, it's a huge, it's it's an industrial revolution. I truly do believe that it is a big change in our society in the way that we do things. And it will come like a bulldozer, whether we want it or not. <laughs> so uh, the, big, the, the big companies, everybody's invested too much in this at this point. It's happened. Uh, and so we have to be very sensitive about that. And then, you know, in terms of tech, uh, you know, on tech limitations, um, this is in the process, I would say, of being solved. But the past year or so, there's been a supreme limit on hardware that's available. Um, we just can't make enough hardware. We can't make it fast enough. We can't. We don't have enough data centers. We don't have enough chips, right? And so, increasing the supply lines for those type of things um, is going to be key to unlocking a lot of the possibilities here, and also making all these things uh, a reasonable cost for most corporations or most people to use, right? So. And then I would say, and that's a different topic, but yeah, I would say we need to focus in on the hardware to run it at this point. The research is, everybody is working on research on this at the point. But as a, obviously I don't want to end this on a, on a little negative note, but as a whole, you are very, very excited about it. And, and obviously the, the limitations and well, not the limitations, it's, it's unlimited, isn't it? In terms of what can Ben, how, how everything can be benefited and and you know like you said technology and um, everything that you're doing at the moment you know everything's in it there's obviously are some challenges but there are a lot of positives with it yes i i wouldn't call it unlimited because i think i try to steer people away from saying this is going to be the solve all of your problems you know <laughs> you think you know like five years ago people, we, people were saying big data was gonna 10 years ago big data was gonna yeah. solve all the problems and and I was like, wow, what do we do with all this big data? Let's hire data scientists. Wow, we don't know what the value of those data scientists are. What, what are we doing here, right? So it's not going to solve all of your problems. Um, you know, fundamentally, we're dealing with calculus and linear algebra, right? It's AI and oh, we'll just use the term machine learning, machine learning writ large is like calculus on manifolds. It's, it's math, right? We don't want to say that math can do everything in the world and solve all the problems, but things that are uh, anything to do with like information processing, obviously, huge improvements. Anything that is mundane, that is, you think about information retrieval, you think about um, creating documents, creating slides, creating uh, processes that might take you too long, processes that are very time intensive, that's what it's good at, right? Mm -hmm. And so thinking about ways that we can improve productivity, improve, you know, an individual worker situation, just to improve a business outcome yeah. by eliminating some of that slack in a system that that's, that's where the magic is. It's not going to solve all your problems. You know, you have to think about it being very pointed. Yeah. Bro. Bro. Absolutely. Massive, massive. Thanks. Um, again, for joining me, Patrick. Um, it was great to have you on the Hubscale podcast. Um, it's really good to hear, you know, good about your journey and how you've come over a, a number of things and challenges and great to hear obviously how positive uh, everything can be in terms of the AI um, evolving and how exciting it is for our future. Um, so yeah, it's been an exciting time. <laughs> nice one. Thanks very much, Patrick. Thanks. Appreciate it.